thank you for listening to this Calvary Aurora Bible study with Pastor Ed Taylor. We pray as you study through God's Word that you're blessed by God's abounding grace. Amen. Take your Bibles and open them to 1 Kings chapter 14 uh, as we turn our attention to the Word of God. And we're in a season, as you know, of the kingdom of God, the nation of Israel that is divided. Unfortunately, no longer one, but two. And we're studying the ups and downs, mostly the downs of the divided kingdom. Israel's in the north, starting with Jeroboam, Judah in the south with Rehoboam. And we know this to be true, that division always ends poorly. A house divided, Jesus says, will not, cannot stand. And division's always ugly among the people of God. It's unfortunate. It exists in our humanity. It's hard to solve. In the spirit, the Lord is able to bring things together. There's a sweet unity that's available to all of us in the spirit of God. And I realize some of you listening in right now are in very divisive situations that you wish would end. We need to just keep praying that the Lord would act, that, that God would intervene, that hearts would be softened, that humility would win over. Others of you listening in are the divisive ones. And the word of the Lord to you is to repent. To repent. With all the failure that we learn of in most of the kings, we learn some important lessons. Lest you get bogged down. Remember, as we're going through the Bible together, one of the advantages is that you get to read ahead and you can soak it in before you ever come to Bible study, before you ever turn on the computer. You can soak it in. And lest you get weary of all the failures that we read of, there's some highlights of victory and success in there, but there's much to be learned from failure. There's much to be learned really looking at other people's failures. You know, we don't always have to be the ones that fail in order to learn. We can learn from the examples of others, both in their good example, and we can learn how not to be in their bad example. But one thing we learn, and if you're taking notes, write this down. This is something that's so clear. And if we don't already know it, I pray by the time we end, uh, either our study today or the entirety of our studies and through the Kings and Chronicles, it's simply this. We learn how completely incapable man is in reigning over man. How incredibly un- incapable you and I are in our own strength and our own wisdom to rule over man. And there have been all sorts of attempts to do this. All sorts of inventions. All sorts of different types of governments that have been tried from the very beginning of civilization and every single one of them has failed to accomplish its end goal. Even some of the best forms of government, some of the ones that most of us would completely agree with, have not successfully ruled over man. Why? Because man is corrupt. And the best of men, the best of men, are still men at best. (laughs) The best of men. And it doesn't matter any type of system. Once you reject God as ruler, any system will fall short. Even in a system like ours, in in our own government, the way it sits today with its checks and its balances, there are glaring weaknesses that man has been able to exploit. In our own governmental system, in our own country, there, there have been... Glaring weaknesses that men over the years, and women for that matter, have exploited for their own selfish gain and motives. And the same is true in the body of Christ. For us as a church, the church, so much arguing and disagreeing and, and, and so much pressure and, and, man, everybody just wanting to make sure that their form of government is best happens in the church. How a church should be overseen. I'm reminded what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. He writes, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock that when the chief shepherd appears, you receive the crown of glory does not 
fade away. Peter, he gives a great exhortation and encouragement and instruction on how to lead. And he gives point by point that we've looked at in, uh, in other Bible studies through Second Peter. But for the time of our Bible study tonight, it's enough to say that there are varying ways among the body of Christ today that churches are led and overseen. The word elder there in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, the word elder it literally can be translated pastor, elder, or overseer. They're all interchangeably in the New Testament. The word elder, presbyteros, is a word that describes the man, the mature man. Not necessarily in age, but in spiritual maturity. There's another word used for leadership or leaders. It's the word bishop or episkopos. And this describes the ministry. It means overseeing. It means not to be overbearing or lording over. And pastor is the method or the methodology of leadership, whereby God would have us in lead, as leaders to feed and tend the flock. I think the greatest example of leadership comes from Jesus himself, of course. But if there was just one element besides the cross, it would be the time that Jesus washed feet and he served his disciples. He took the place of the lowest servant in order to serve, and we never go wrong when we choose that. And because there's different methodologies in the church, it's led to a lot of confusion, a lot of consternation, a lot of argumentation over how churches should be run. And it's using these very Greek words uh, that we just mentioned. For example, there's the Presbyterian form of leadership in the church where that involves a plurality of elders ruling with co-equal authority within the church, and many churches are overseen that way. There's the Episcopal type of church, or often also can be referred to as a pastor-led type of church. They're kind of interchangeable, although there's also distinctions. But Episcopal church is where one person, often referred to as the bishop, oversees many other leaders and churches throughout a region. Some churches are overseen that way. Some churches are overseen in a congregational way where everything in the church is ratified by a church vote. Nothing really moves forward without everyone's approval. Then there's the pastor-led church that's modeled, as we see throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, by Moses or Paul or Timothy or Titus, where God will raise up and use a man to pastor a flock and raising up spiritual leadership of accountability around them together. And there's another model of leadership that's become very popular in the last 20 years, and that is the leadership where the business world has come into the church, and now the church is run like a business. And it's referred to like a business, and we use the same titles that are used in the business world. And I would say that in some of the other forms of government that mentioned, uh, you see them in the Bible. You don't see this business model. It's just something that is more Western in, in, uh, from the Western culture that's come in, um, and the other ones that you see in the Bible, Presbyterian, Episcopos, elders, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Once you settle on what you believe the Bible teaches on a particular form of leadership, don't trust in it. Don't trust in the form of leadership. Trust in the Lord of the leaders. Because what I have found in my observation over all these forms and having friends in many different churches and many different styles of churches, including the Calvary family of churches, what I have found is that the form of government, as long as it's biblical, is not as important as the character and the integrity of those that have been entrusted with spiritual leadership. That's the key. When you look at the qualities and qualifications that Paul lays out for young Timothy in appointing elders, you find that they are character issues in a man's life. They are character issues. It's not a position for the person. It's a position of the heart that matters. And, and you can have, you know, whatever form of government that you're most comfortable with, but, but here's the thing. If the wrong people are put into places of leadership, or if the right people are put into positions of leadership, and sometime down the road turn away from the Lord, it doesn't matter what system of government is there. There's going to be trouble. Because what I've found in the body of Christ, and I think it's true for you, I know it's certainly true for me, that in order for me to really receive from my pastor, I need to trust him. I need to trust him. And I do trust him. I do trust my pastor, Jeff Johnson. I trust him. And I believe that when he prays, he hears from the Lord. I don't think he's a perfect man, and neither am I. I know some of you could say the same thing about me. You say, Ed, I trust you. And for that, I take very, very seriously. And at the same time, you can also say, I trust you, but I know you're not a perfect man. 
And we can all get an amen for that. I'm surprised Marie didn't say amen. She knows. She lives with me. She knows. I'm not a perfect man. Neither are the pastoral men here. We're not perfect men. But I believe we have a team of men that our hearts are set to seek the Lord. We want to hear from the Lord. We want to serve you well. We want to own up to our mistakes. We want to humble ourselves before you. We want, to, we want to serve God so that you have joy and we have joy, but none of us are perfect. And I believe what God is looking for are leaders that serve and servants that lead. And, and we don't ever leave servanthood. The way of ministry, you know, as you think of all the responsibilities you get, the, way, the more responsibility the Lord gives you, whether it's in the church or <clears throat> in the world, because every believer is a leader, Every believer has leadership because you have the very Holy Spirit of God dwelling in you. And God is a leader. And whatever, what, ro- what realm of life you're in, where you work, what cubicle you're in, what bus you drive, or what phone you answer, you, have the, you, have that, you, are a, you are a follower of Jesus Christ and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. And because of your presence of where you are, whether you're at home raising the kids or you're homeschooling the kids or you're teaching kids in the public, wherever you are, you're a leader. And the greater you're a servant, the greater leader will you be. And as you get more responsibility, as God gives you more responsibility, whether it's through the leadership of your church here or you get a promotion at work, as God begins to enlarge your sphere of influence and enlarge your ability to speak into people's lives, you don't become less of a servant. You need to match that, that, that promotion, if you will. The Bible says that promotion doesn't come from the east or the west, but God puts down one and raises up another. So only promotion comes from the Lord. It wasn't your supervisor. It wasn't everybody voting for you. It wasn't your employee of the month plaque that got you the promotion. God gave you that promotion. And he deserves the credit for that. And the way that you respond to that, the way you respond to that is that the greater responsibility that you and I are given, the greater the servant we must be. If you don't match greater responsibility with greater servanthood, you will deceive yourself and quite possibly hurt people in a very significant way and miss out what the Lord is speaking to you. Now, we spent a considerable amount of time on that because the chapter before us is pretty straightforward. And we'll pull out a few things, but it's a pretty straightforward chapter. So pick up with me in verse 1 with all that in mind as we watch the failures of the kings and we're reminded where we're at. Verse Kings, chapter 14, verse 1. At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, became sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, please arise, disguise yourself, that they may not recognize you as the wife of Jeroboam and go to Shiloh. Indeed, Ahijah the prophet is there who told me that I would be a king over this people. Also take with you ten loaves, some cakes, a jar of honey, and go to him. He will tell you what will become of the child. And Jeroboam's wife did so. She arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were glazed by reason of his age. Now don't miss the verse 1 at that time. What time? Well, look back in verse 33 of chapter 13. Uh, After this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way. Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way. Verse 34, this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam. At that time, his son got sick. His son got sick, and so he sends his wife to find a prophet. The very prophet that spoke to him that he would be king. He he isn't asking for counsel. There's no indication he's asking for counsel. There's no indication that he's asking for prayer. There's no indication that he wants to hear from the Lord. It just seems as if, and, and I think we can pull from the context, that he just wants to know the future. And as he sins, he sends her and he wants her to be disguised. And he, she finally meets up with Ahijah. And it says that Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were glazed by reason of his age. Now, he wasn't able to see, but he could hear. And this is a great picture. If we were developing this for just a topical Bible study, we'll see with Ahijah, Ahijah becomes a great picture of not being able to see physically, but able to see spiritually, as you'll see in the text. Verse 5. Now, the Lord had said to Ahijah, here is the wife of Jeroboam coming to ask you something about her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus you shall say to her, for it will be that when she comes in, that she will pretend to be another woman. Now, verse 5, you might want to mark, put a star around it, put a heart right next to it, 
I want God to speak to me like this. I hope you do. You know, your eyes don't have to be glazed over. I mean, there are so many times where people are pulling the wool over our eyes, where they're flat out lying. And they're flat out not telling the truth. And we can see perfectly, but we just don't see spiritually. And here's an example of God telling us exactly what's going to happen. I don't know about you, but I want God to speak to me like that. I want God to reveal things to me that I don't know. And that I can't see. And and that I am uncertain. I have to say many times in ministry, God has revealed to me after the fact. That's a pretty painful revelation. He's revealed to me after the fact. But Lord, talk to me like this. <laughs> Maybe that'll be your prayer tonight. God, talk to me like this. Give me the scoop. Maybe you have a situation right now where you just don't know what is happening. Well, man, look at Now the Lord said to Ahijah, and I believe you, can, you have an even deeper relationship with God than Ahijah did because the Spirit of God lives in you permanently. And so it was, verse 6, When Ahijah heard the sound of her footsteps, as she came through the door, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. (laughs) The disguise did not work. But you know what I see here? He believed the word of the Lord. Come in, wife of Jeroboam. If you like to write in your Bibles there, you can write the word busted. (laughs) Because even if it doesn't happen, even if it doesn't happen, even if God didn't speak to Ahijah, even if Ahijah didn't say, Come in, wife of Jeroboam, guess what? She was busted all along. God knew. This is no surprise to God. You know, we, we don't get anything over on God in our lives. We can't hide anything. And so here, come in, wife of Jeremiah. Why do you pretend to be another person? For I have been sent to you with bad news. Go tell Jeroboam, verse 7. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. Because I exalted you from among the people and made you ruler over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you and yet you have not been as my servant David who kept my commandments and who followed me with all of his heart to do only what was right in his eyes but you have done more evil than all who were before you for you have gone and made yourself other gods and molded images to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back Therefore, behold, I will bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam every male in Israel, bond and free, and I will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as one takes away refuse until it's all gone. The disguise does absolutely nothing. The blind prophet could see right through it and was given a word from the Lord. Jeroboam, you're a horrible leader. You haven't acknowledged me in your life. And the worst of the worst, verse 9, you've done more evil than all who were before you. What a testimony. Leading his people into idolatry. And because of that, your family will suffer, verse 11. The dog shall eat whoever belongs to Jeroboam and dies in the city. And the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. For the Lord has spoken it. Arise, therefore, go to your own house. When your feet enter the city, the child shall die. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he is the only one of Jeroboam who shall come to the grave, because in him there is found something good toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Verse 14. Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam. This is the day. What? Even now. For the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. He will uproot Israel from this good land which he gave to their fathers and will scatter them beyond the river because they've made their wooden images provoking the Lord to anger. And he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who sinned and who made Israel sin. What a strong word. What a hard word to deliver. But he was faithful. He obeyed. Verse 17. Then Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Terzah. When she came to the threshold of the house... The child died, and they buried him, and all Israel mourned for him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through his servant, Ahijah, the prophet. Now, the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he made war and how he reigned, indeed, they're written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. The period that Jeroboam reigned was 22 years, and he rested with his fathers. Then Nadab, his son, reigned in his place. So she was sent back with a difficult word. And on top of the horrific tragedy, the rest of the family will die as well. 
It would only be a couple of years before the fullness of the prophecy would be completed. A man by the name of Baasha not only, did not only kill Nadab, but also the entire house of Jeroboam. But this prophecy goes beyond the current situation. It goes beyond into the future of Israel, speaking into the future. Things would go from bad to worse for them. It will get so bad that God will finally remove them from the land by scattering them by the Assyrians. That spiritual law that we just can't get out from under, believer and unbeliever alike. Let me show it to you. I've quoted it often. Let me show it in your Bible. Would you go to Galatians chapter 6? There is that spiritual law that none of us, this is going to be a recurring theme throughout the, throughout the book of Kings and Chronicles where we watch this happening over and over again. Now, gloriously, by faith in Jesus Christ, he took the death penalty for you and for me. He took the death penalty for you and for me, and yet there are still consequences from our decisions. And even then, God is gracious. I think back to all the things that could have easily happened to me, all the times that I rebelled against God, all of the times, both believer, which as unbeliever, really, really bad, and believer, just as bad, that they may not be uh, as dramatic as when I was an unbeliever, but sin against God is sin. And I, I see how gracious God and how patient God and how loving God has been with me, and, and at times has it been so gracious that I haven't felt the full weight of consequences. And yet, there have also been times when God has allowed the full weight of consequences to be felt by me because of my sin. It's a spiritual law. It's this law of sowing and reaping. You guys all believe in gravity? Does, do we all believe in gravity? <clears throat> I don't, I'm not going to ask you to test it if you don't. Well, I don't believe in gravity. And I go, oh, we're going to jump off a bridge. I'm not going to tell you to do that. Don't do that. But you could jump up, you know, if you don't believe in gravity, just get up right now and jump and see how, how long you float and let me know how it goes. <laughs> gravity is real. It can be tested. It can be proven. It can be observed. It's being felt right now. Well, just as real as the physical law of gravity is, the spiritual law of sowing and reaping is just as real. I announced this last weekend that one of the things that we do as a church is we go as, uh, as a church and we go pick corn. Some of you heard that announcement. We pick corn. And all the, there's a brother in the church that they, they grow a big field of corn. They donate the field. They donate the corn. And then when it goes in to be picked, put it in these big bags, and it gets donated to the food bank of the Rockies. And we do that every year. And it's a fun family thing that you get to be involved in if you'd like. And the farmer that planted the corn believes very firmly. I don't know him, and I've never spoken to him, but I'm pretty sure 99.9% .9 I can vouch for the guy. He believes in this spiritual law of sowing and reaping because he's learned it from the physical. So that when you go out and pick corn, you can look backwards and understand the reason you're picking corn, the consequence of picking corn and these stalks of corn has come because he planted what? Corn. And you guys are looking at me like, come on, dude, seriously. <laughs> yes, I'm serious. I want you, even if you think it's a silly illustration, I want you to, to be in your head. You can just think, oh, Ed is just silly and goofy all the time, and he's just telling us stuff that we already know. Yeah, I want you to go out thinking that. Corn, of course, you plant corn. I can't believe what kind of pastor he is. Plant corn, get corn. Of course! I don't know if you talk like that, but maybe you feel like that. Fine. <laughs> Fine, maybe on the radio. I can't believe it. Who's, who lets this guy on the radio talk about corn? Of course you're back corn. Of course, yes. I want you to be that convinced because this is true too. Galatians chapter 6. I want you to feel the same way. Galatians chapter 6. Pick up in verse 6. Let him who is taught in the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, you read the rest. You ready? That, for he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, and he who sows to the spirit of the spirit will reap everlasting life. They're both true. They're both true. Sowing to the spirit is going to be beautiful. It's going to be wonderful. It may take some time. It takes time for a crop to 
to grow. It may take some, get rid of some of the pests. You may get the need to toil or, or you know, get the soil all ready and till the ground. It may take time, but you can be sure that the one that sows to the Spirit is going to reap everlasting life. The one that sows to the Spirit with their life, with their actions, with their thoughts, with their mind, with their love, with their possessions, just constantly sowing in the spiritual realm, being led by the Spirit, living in the Spirit, you can be promised by the Word of God, as much as that corn farming guy planted corn and expected corn, you can expect that God will keep His Word when you sow to the Spirit. And we're all warned that if we choose to reap Uh, We choose to sow to our flesh, the things of our flesh. You can read later a few of those things in chapter 5, beginning in verse 19, but it's much more than that. If we choose to be disobedient toward the things of God, you can can be warned, and certainly we don't really expect it, but I put that into your heart tonight, that you would expect that you will reap corruption. Sin corrupts, so much so that Paul the Apostle would describe it to the church, the believers in Rome. He would tell the Romans that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. There's only two outcomes. Everlasting life or corruption. And it's a sobering passage. Because we have to be serious about every thought. We have to be serious about every action, every word that brings both blessing or cursing. And when it comes to our relationship with God the Father, we just can't decide to to tear pages out of the Bible. We can't just decide that we're going to create a religion on our own terms, but rather to follow the leading of the Spirit, sowing to the Spirit. And and what does he say in verse 9? As you're sowing to the Spirit, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. It's just a word for the Lord for some of you. You're, You're right there. You're right at the edge. You're ready to reap. Don't quit. Don't lose heart. You're right there at the edge. Move, keep moving forward. God has promised a harvest. So just keep moving forward. Obedient. As Elizabeth Elliot teaches, do the next thing. Do the next thing. Let the Lord encourage you and do the next thing and stay faithful. Stay faithful. And then he says in verse 10, therefore, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And it really speaks to the, the, the beautiful privilege that we have to really minister to the body of Christ, to minister to one another, to, to serve. We have missionaries here to pray for them, to serve them, to encourage them, to start with the body of Christ because it's good, the household of faith, it's good practice for serving a lost and dying world. It's not exclusive You don't want to become some little social club here where all we care about is one another and all we do is have little holy huddles and we hide in here and take care of one another and just, no, it starts. It's just the start. God has been so good to us. How can we not be so good to one another? Then, then it leaches out. Then it's the overflow. But, you know, here's the thing. We started with this idea of division and and how the, 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 the nation is divided. You know, in division... In division, we're just not sure what to do and where to go and who to side with. And before you know it, you're not doing good to anybody anymore. Come back with me in 1 Kings as we wind up with the rest of the chapter. It's just a great danger for us to keep all that God has given to us to ourselves. Do good to the household of faith. So to the Spirit. Perhaps the Lord has allowed you to suffer the consequences right now of your sin and sowing to the flesh. But know that God allows that in your life, believer. He allows that in your life to chasten you or to discipline you because you're his kid. If you weren't disciplined, then the Bible says you're not his kid. Now, you wonder, wait a minute, is this true for even people? I don't follow God right now and I don't care about God. Is it true for me? It's true for you. It's just as like gravity is true for those that follow Jesus and gravity is true for those that don't. So is this spiritual law. It's true for you too. So why? Why would I suffer the consequences? What's the big deal? If becoming a believer doesn't get me outside of the consequences, then what's the big deal? Why should I, why should I follow that? If I'm just going to do, if I'm going to suffer like everyone else, <laughs> let, me, let me answer that question for you because I'm glad you asked it. First of all, first of all, 
You experience the consequences of your actions because they're the consequences of your actions. And God uses them in your life to reveal to you the utter emptiness that life is apart from him. You see, when we're disciplined by our dad, we know because our dad loves us. He cares for us. We have that sense. We know that our Father in heaven is training us and teaching us, and we're becoming different, and we're becoming more Christ-like, and and there's a purpose and a plan in what God is working out in our lives. And so as painful as it is, we we embrace the chastening of our Father. We don't like it. Even in the Bible, it says, hey, nobody likes it when they're chastened. I agree. I never had one of my kids say, thank you, may I have another? Never. (laughs) Never. They were always pleading for mercy, and I don't blame them. And many times we gave them mercy, as God does with us. So number one, the consequences are there because, man, because there are consequences. And number two, God is using them in your life to reveal himself to you. Because isn't it true, at times in your life, you've been suffering the, the consequences of your sin. Like I think of people that get caught by the police. They become immediately perfect people. I'll never do it again. Oh, if you just let me go, please, officer, forever. And God, if you ever get me out of here, I will. And you're listening in jail right now, and you've said that. When God gets you out, serve him completely. Never get in trouble again. Only time you go back to prison, go back as a prison ministry. Because I don't, I don't begrudge you for saying that, but you're saying it because of the consequence. You weren't saying it when you were in sin, but now that you got caught, man, God, I'll give you myself. I'll, I'll serve you the rest of my life. Keep your word. Thirdly, I think that God allows unbelievers to suffer the consequences and to feel the weight of consequences to reveal himself to you because he loves you. Jesus Christ, he suffered the consequence for sin, and yet he was innocent. And we look at an innocent man hanging on the cross and our heart breaks. We say, how is that possible? Why is he dying? Why is he on the cross? I deserve what he did, and yet he's paying the price for me. Why? Because God wants to open your eyes to what true love looks like. The Bible says that God demonstrated his love to us. That while we were yet sinners, which is all of us, Christ died for the ungodly. How would you ever know that you're ungodly unless you suffered the consequences of your sin? That's really the issue. You don't like the word sin? That's okay. We'll call it mistakes. You don't like the word mistakes? That's fine. We'll call it breaking the law. We'll call it mishaps. We'll call it whatever it is that reveals to you. See, God calls it sin. So you can call it whatever you want. And that's fine, because I'll work with you all the way. We'll start with mishaps, and we'll start with mistakes, and then we'll start with, and then we're going to end up at sin. Because that's what God calls it. And it's okay. If you want to start here, I'll walk with you. You can look at your life and you go, man, I'm not a perfect person. As, as, this last Sunday after I went home, you know, I was just thinking on the way home from, uh, from the services that all three services, I called everybody listening, I called us all liars. That's a pretty heavy thing for a pastor to do. But it's the truth. We've all lied. And even as believers, if you weren't here and you go, Ed, you didn't call me a liar, listen to the message. <laughs> I think I made a compelling case for The fact that even as believers, we can be dishonest. Shading the truth. Now, of course, we don't like to be called liars. But that's only because it's hard to see ourselves in the mirror. And it's hard to admit any weakness in our lives. And for those of you that are apart from Jesus Christ right now, it's really hard for you. I might have, even as what I just shared right now, I got a few laughs from those that know me, but you don't know me. I might have aroused in you some anger and some frustration. How can you say that? And who do you think you are? And Mr. Pastor up there, and you think you're perfect. No, no, no. Mm -mm. I just know this. Whatever biblical means necessary to get your attention toward God, I'm willing to do. I'm not really concerned about what you think about me, but I'm very concerned about what you think about the God that loves you and cares for you. And I just know this, if somebody loves me, they're going to tell me the truth. If somebody doesn't love me, they're going to lie to me, they're going to do stuff behind my back, they're going to do all kinds of things to try to hurt and to harm me. Somebody telling me the truth in love is not trying to hurt or harm me, they're trying to help me. 
So today, you have a chance, an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ, an opportunity to ex- examine in your mind, you know, even with using your imagination of what it must have been like to stand at the cross and see a brutally beaten man die a torturous death for you and for me. To see what it is to recognize that when, as we come back to First Kings now, as we, as we find ourselves in a place of all these failures and, and what God has allowed in their lives and the consequences of his sin and how a man loses his whole family and on and on, why? Because of sin, that it's God's heart for you not to live this way. And so notice in verse 21, he says, And Rehoboam, we're turning now to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, he reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Naama and Ammonitus. Now Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. They provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they committed, more than all that their fathers had done. For they also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars and wooden images, on every high hill and every green tree. And there were also perverted persons in the land. There was sexual sin. They had all kinds of abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And it happened, verse 25, in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, that Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away all the gold shields which Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam made bronze shields in their place and committed them to the hands of the captains of the guards who guarded the doorway of the king's house. And so it was, whenever the king went into the house of the Lord, that the guards carried them and brought them back into the guard chamber. And the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. Rehoboam rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Naama and Ammonitus, and Abijam, his son, reigned in his place. Now I've got another 15 minutes of commentary on this that is going to wait till next time. So you'll just have to tune in next time and show up next time because I don't want to go through it really quick. But enough to say this. Jeroboam had problems. Rehoboam had problems. And the major issue, the crux of their problems is they turned their back on God. They turned their back on God and became idolaters. And may the Lord protect us from turning our backs on him. So Father, I know there's much more to share and I know that you have more to share with us, but instead, you would take us down the lane of salvation and grace. We think about how consequences can so easily disturb us and discourage us. But in reality, they are used to draw us. For us as believers, if it's possible, God, I thank you. I mean, if, I, I, mean I, I, I want to mean this, God. I thank you for your discipline and chastening in my life. I don't like it. I don't like it when it's happening. But I'm grateful that you love me enough to teach me. And that even the consequences for my bad decisions are not wasted. They're not wasted that you can even redeem what was meant for evil, you turn around for good. But it's so painful, Lord, and I just pray for those under the weight of pain tonight, the pain of their own decisions and consequences, Lord, that you might be merciful to us. Would you pour out your mercy upon us tonight and not give us what we deserve, but rather be gracious toward us, giving us that which we don't deserve, Father, we know that you've done so much for us. You've given us all things, and yet, as a good dad, you still give more and more and more. And so I pray for those that are here, those that are listening in, that are separated from you right now, that are in a a heavy situation, and for a brief moment, they're turning in their hearts and attention towards you. Would you draw them to you, God? Would you do that work, Father, of drawing them to you with cords of love? Would you reveal to them the depth of your love for them? Would you give them that, that power supernaturally to recognize the demonstration of your love? That even while we were 
still sinners. You died for us. You didn't wait for us to clean up. Uh, You didn't wait for us to change. You didn't wait for us uh, to get everything in order, but you saved us as we are, as we were, I should say. Grow us up into what you want us to be. So I want to give you a chance. If you're here tonight, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, today is the day. Uh, Now is the moment. And so I just want to ask you, if that's you, would you just stand to your feet? I want to pray with you. I want, to, I want to give you an opportunity to publicly respond to the gospel. Of course, you guys on the radio, I don't see you or on the internet, but God sees you. <clears throat> and there's just that sense of turning your life toward God today, repenting of your sins. That's a Bible word for mean to turn away from your sins, to turn away from, to turn away from. God bless you. God bless you. You guys standing next to him that are believers, can you lay your hands on this brother over here? Just, yeah, you, on, on my left, so you're this side. You guys can open your eyes and look at me. We'll wait. You guys over here. Um, Anybody else that would say, that's me? I think there's more than just one. But if there's just one, all the heavens and all the angels in heaven rejoice. So it's okay. But if there's more, I just acknowledge you out on the radio. I acknowledge you on the internet that God sees you. And we called you out in prison Uh, in jail, in the Denver jail, and you're listening, and you made that commitment to follow God. So whether you're getting out or you're staying in, follow God. Follow God. Anyone else in here? They give us a chance to rejoice with you. Um, Like Matthew, just get up and follow him open, wholeheartedly and open. And so... For those of you that responded, just just right now, say, God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I believe you sent Jesus Christ to die for me and rise again from the dead because you love me. And I want to follow you all the days of my life. Help me, God, to break free from the shackles of sin and to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We pray that you've been touched by this study from Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call area code 303-628-7200. Be blessed this week in the Lord.